everybody. Good afternoon. Um, I've just had a very big burger, so I'm a little bit sleepy. So if this presentation goes a bit slower, that I blame the burger. So good afternoon, everybody. I hope you've enjoyed the conference so far. If you've also had your lunch, I won't hold it against you. If you fall asleep, I won't take it personally. Um, today, I'm talking a bit about a hot topic um, over the last six months, which is automation, AI, and things like that. Um, there are, if you came to my previous presentation, I have stolen some slides from this and put it in that one. So these are technically the original slides, but just bear with me if you did come to my previous presentation, there's probably like three or four slides which are very similar. Um, a little bit about myself. So my name is Jamie Coleman. I am a developer advocate for Sonatype. Uh, previously, I worked at IBM for the whole of my career started with mainframes which was interesting coming out of university um, I was one of the first people I think I was the first person to containerize an IBM product when docker became a thing um, set of automation pipelines for the delivery of those then um, we basically open source WebSphere Liberty to open Liberty so worked on that a little bit worked on openj9 which is IBM's JVM uh, used by quite a lot of enterprises around the world basically because it comes free with IBM products and then about seven months ago I thought I would try um, a totally different field security um, because there's only so many talks I can do about microservices so this is where I ended up at Sonatype so hands up audience who's heard of Sonatype before Oh, that's a surprising amount. It means my, I'm doing my job because when I started this, I'm doing my job well because when I started this, there was only a very small few people who had heard of Sonatype and half of those thought we were Sonacube. So um, at least I'm spreading the word of, about Sonatype. Um, so what you probably w were well known for or maybe not so well known for is we run Maven Central for you all. Um, we've been doing this for about 10 years now. Um, just something we do for the community um, and it also because we're a security company it provides us with loads and loads of data um, on all the different open source Java dependencies everyone downloads and of course we do commercial stuff we are a uh, business so we have to make money um, some of you will probably be familiar with Nexus repository but we do loads of other stuff as well as you can see um, not all specifically Java but of course Java is the main language um, that we support and the founder, the co-founder co of Sonatype, Brian Fox, he was one of the original Maven contributors um, and he essentially ran Maven Central under his desk for quite a long time until we ended up putting it on AWS. So what are we going to be talking about today in this presentation? Well, I'm going to be talking about the AI revolution, the current state of AI in the world. Um, and then what I've done is I've generated, I've asked ChatGPT to generate some slides for me. So I asked it the advantages of AI, so it generated those slides, and the disadvantages of AI, it generated those as well. And what I want you to all try and notice is, is there any bias in what ChatGPT has generated here? Um, there's one main thing of bias, but I want to see if you, you spot it. Um, then I'll talk about should we be worried as developers, engineers, um, should we be worried about AI taking our jobs? Um, and I'll move on to yes, but not for the reason of taking our jobs, for other reasons. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the uses we as developers can take advantage of AI. Um, talk a little bit about how Sonatype use AI in some of our commercial products. Then I'm going to give you my personal conclusion on AI. Um, and then we'll just wrap up and some links and stuff at the end. So AI has been in the news quite a lot lately. Um, probably because ChatGPT made it very, very accessible to everybody. I don't know if you've all seen uh, the, uh, what was it? Ryan Reynolds generated a video for, I think it was Mint Mobile. It was surprisingly good. Um, but the fact that people like Ryan Reynolds, for example, can access this technology, I think, is probably what's made it very, very uh, newsworthy, um, popular, let's say. But AI has been around for a long time. Um, it's not a new thing. So the Turing machine test, Alan Turing, um, he didn't invent the computer, but he probably was the first person to ever build one. I think it was actually a Polish guy or girl um, that had 
built, designed the first computer. But as you can imagine, building a computer in the, I think it was in the 30s or 40s, was very, very expensive. Um, so he was one of the first people to actually build a computer, probably familiar with it. Um, it was basically allowed um, the Allies to essentially undecipher all the German um, codes. And they kept that secret throughout the whole war. So practically because of this man is kind of the reason that, that it ended up that way, which is quite impressive. But he essentially created a test, um, the Turing test, which was kind of a test to see if AI was better than humans. But I'll move on to a little bit more about that afterwards. Um, then in 1955, um, essentially, uh, Alan Newell and Herbert A. Simon created the first artificial intelligence program, um, that was called the Logic Theorist, and that program um, proved about 38 to f of f 52 mathematical problems, um, which is, again, this is 1955, so AI has been around quite a while. Um, then we go to Eliza, which was one of the first chatbots in the world. That was in 1966. Um, the Wabot-1 was a robot. Um, no surprises that Japan were the first to create uh, the first robot with AI inside. And then we move on to IBM Deep Blue. Um, IBM Deep Blue was a very impressive machine. Uh, it was essentially the first machine to actually be a human in chess. Um, so it was really the point where AI started to get better than human beings at certain things. Um, hands up, who's got a rumba or a, 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 a floor cleaning robot, a few of you. So this was the first product in our home to include AI inside the actual product itself. Um, I have a Husky, so I bought one of these last year and it saves me hours and hours of cleaning. Um, I'm not sure that AI in my one is quite as sophisticated as the rumba, but hey ho. Uh, this was, uh, yeah, again, the first time we saw AI entering our homes. Then we had IBM Watson. And this is why I kind of, I don't buy into so much of the AI hype because I worked at IBM when IBM Watson was a thing. And we, IBM, oh, yeah, yeah. IBM Watson pretty much had these capabilities in 2011. Yes, it didn't have a nice friendly front UI that you could just type into. It was a bit more involved, plugging into APIs, talking to Watson on the cloud. But what I see coming out of ChatGPT, et cetera, these days, um, I saw coming out of IBM Watson quite a while ago. So that's why I try and swim through all the different hype um, and try and drill down to what actually is advancing in AI. Um, Eugene Gutzman, uh, this was essentially um, uh, these were the guys that essentially beat, managed to, uh, it was the first AI to beat the Turing test. Um, and I'll explain a little bit about what the Turing test is afterwards and how it works. And then I think ChatGPT was the pivotal moment for AI, which really made it popular. So there's certain technologies in our industry, which I think win. They just, they've won. Um, certain things like, for example, if we go to the music industry, Spotify. I think Spotify just, just blatantly won. It made everything so convenient. Um, for example, GitHub. I think GitHub changed the open source landscape. GitHub just won the repository world, in my opinion. It's just one of those technologies. And I think ChatGPT is, again, it made AI so accessible to everybody. I mean, you don't need to be technical to use AI. And I think that's what ChatGPT did. And I think it's one of those pivotal moments in our industry that, again, it's not a crazy amount, like it's just machine learning, etc. But it is really that point where it makes it so accessible to everyone that it's so easy to use and then it just becomes popular. So the Turing test, what is the Turing test? Um, the Turing test is essentially you pit a human against a robot and you have some people who essentially monitor that conversation. They don't know who's the robot and they don't know who's the human. And if you can convince more of the people monitoring that conversation that the robot is the human, then it's essentially passing the Turing test. So this was kind of the first test. And I mean, again, this was created in 1955. So we, Alan Turing knew this was going to eventually become a thing. Um, and that was when we were building computers, with big cogs moving around, etc. So we've we've known for a while AI is going to become like quite big in the future. Um, IBM Deep Blue, as I mentioned, was one of the first AI to essentially um, beat someone at chess. Now the first time it it tried in 1985, it didn't actually win all the matches. Um, it played against against a guy called Gary um, Kasparov. 
Gary Kasparov. He was the champ- world chess champion at the time. Um, and essentially, uh, IBM won two and Gary won four of the matches. But because IBM knew it could beat Gary in two of the matches, it knew it could beat it in most of the matches as well. So they went back to the drawing board, um, trained it even more, etc. And then it pl- again in 1997, it played Gary again. And it won two of the matches. Gary won one and two, three were draws. So realistically, this was the first time a computer was able to beat humans um, at a task such as um, chess, which is quite a complex game if you've ever played it. Um, then we move on to IBM Watson. Now, this was really a big pivotal moment. How many people saw Jeopardy where IBM Watson went against the three best quiz masters in the world? No one? Well, it was a, it was a really great video. Um, and IBM Watson won the prize money of like a million dollars. Um, bear in mind the electricity just to run it throughout that session was probably close to that as well. And the supercomputer that was powering Watson was absolutely huge. It was pretty much fed the whole of Wikipedia, um, but it beat them. Not only did it beat them, it destroyed them. They didn't even have a chance to hit their buzzer. Uh, Watson was figuring out the answers way, way quicker. And for me, this was really a pivotal moment in AI. This was when AI was actually getting really, really, really useful. And for me, the I mean, this could be applied to so many places, especially healthcare was one. Now, I, I don't work for IBM anymore, so I can say that they tend to create stuff a bit ahead of its time until the technology is actually caught up. So I've witnessed the first ever world's tablet um, it's very heavy. It was created in like 19, no, 2001 or something like that. Um, the world's first ever smartphone. It was about this big. Again, all IBM inventions, but of just a bit of virtual reality. There's an IBM virtual reality headset, which was created in 1998. Again, they've got the ideas, but they're just a bit too early. Um, the headset, I don't know if any of you have ever used it, it was horrible. It used to give you headaches. It required a big computer that you have to bolt to your uh, trousers. So again, the ideas are there, just a bit too early. Um, and the same thing with Watson, in my opinion. Now, IBM have actually sold off most of Watson. Um, again, a bit too early, but they're probably regretting that with um, ChatGPT coming out and how popular AI is. But again, they generally have the great ideas. It's just the technology isn't quite there to make them usable for the general public. Um, Eugene Gutzmann, um, possibly, this is possibly the most ad- advanced chatbot um, at its time. It was developed in St. Petersburg with a group of three engineers, um, one Ukrainian, two Russian guys. Probably not going to be the case as of now, but it was actually designed to portray a 13-year-old Ukrainian boy. Um, the reason for that is when it made grammar mistakes or it said something a bit silly, etc. You could forgive it because it was a little young boy, you know, it's not a problem. Um, if you cre- little Ukrainian boy trying to speak in English. But this was really, really good. And this was the first, this actually beat the Turing test. Um, it, well, it finished second place in the Turing test competitions. And in 2014, on the 60th anniversary, it actually convinced 33% of the judges that it was human. So some people actually declared this the first AI to ever actually beat the Turing test. Now, the current state of AI. Um, Personally, my favorite part about all these new AI tools is the image and video generation. I think it's amazing. Um, If you've never played with Adobe's um, generative fill feature, this is quite a new thing. It is amazing. You can take any photo. So that sky there, that was all generated. um, I've cut a little bit off here, but they generated a lake underneath. And all you literally need to do is put Northern Lights, click Generate, and it does it perfectionally. So I think, personally, my favorite stuff is some of this image generation. Uh, The video generation stuff is good. We've all seen the deep fakes of, say, Arnold Schwarzenegger talking, saying something funny, which are all great. Um, And it is a bit scary because we're getting to the point where we don't know what is actually real and what's not. All these people on Instagram taking photos of themselves, now we're even gonna start guessing, like, were they actually even there? Like, do we believe these people? So this this is, for me, one of the most, I think, amazing uses of AI. Um, of course, we got ChatGPT. This was released in November 2022 um, and soon gained popularity afterwards. It was the, It's the fastest growing consumer application in history. Um, and there's loads of other systems that have derived from it. Uh, if you get the Bing app, for example, it has ChatGPT4 in it for free. Um, you can get that on your mobile. It'll even generate images for you. So um, there's no excuse not to try it out. Um, 
but it was it's quite difficult um it had to be trained and there are some dark sides of this so for example uh, i think they used uh, where were they um where in kenya they used workers who they were paying less than two dollars an hour to go through some of the hideous evil responses of chat gpt and train it to the point um they a lot of them that regarded this as torture because you can imagine some of the horrible things people ask chat gpt so yeah there is a, a light and a dark side now chat gpt the company uh, OpenAI, didn't employ them directly they used a third party company who did um, but again, there are obviously these things need training. So, um, and someone has to do it, unfortunately. Um, but I probably pay them a little bit more than two dollars an hour to go through some of the horrible things <laughs> that people probably put into ChatGPT. Um, so, what can we take away from AI? Well, there's so many free tools nowadays, and my opinion is, if you don't start taking advantage of AI, you will be left behind. Um, there is no way that if half of developers around the world are using AI to do some of their tasks and the others that aren't are not going to be able to keep up. It's just AI. I like to talk about AI as Google search on steroids because essentially we can get that same information from um, AI. We can go to Google, we can find this information, but it's probably going to take me 30 minutes as opposed to ChatGPT that can do it in about 10 seconds. So I like to think about um, ChatGPT and AI, especially when we're working with search and things like that, as kind of Google search on steroids. And again, we can do it, but imagine if your colleagues are doing something in 10 seconds that you're doing in 30 minutes. So in my opinion, if we don't start embracing it, because everyone other people will then we will get left behind um, and there'll be ends up being a massive gap in, um, uh, in efficiency of how we create stuff but some of the things we can use for example um, code snippets is amazing and github copilot you're probably familiar with both of those um, github copilot probably for the wrong reasons because um, i know they were using people's code in private repositories to give answers etc which is a no-no um, but code snippets again what these do is help you as you're coding um, and uses AI to try and find the best ways to create something. And this is great because it can help developers, for example, create more efficient applications. And we know we all need to do whatever we can to make the world more efficient. Um, and that's what these things can do. They can also essentially help junior developers catch up with more senior developers rather than taking 10 years of coding and people saying, no, you can do that in a better way. You can do that in a better way. They can find out instantly as they're typing the code, after they finish a method, these kind of things can go, now you can do that better, you can do this better. Whereas tr traditionally, it could have taken us 10 years to kind of get to that level. Um, so both of these are really, really, really good things to use. Um, I hate dealing with regex. I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. It's just one of my pain points. Um, but auto regex is really, really great. You can use natural language and just tell it what you want it to do and it will generate the regex for you. So do take advantage of that if you are ever using it. Um, Mintify is quite good because it can essentially create documentation and comments for you. Again, another thing, I don't mind documentation, but it's not what I signed up for when I did a software engineering degree. Um, and Mintify can do that for you. So again, taking advantage of AI, it scans your functions, figures out what they do. And as long as you name like, the methods correctly um, and the variables correctly, then it's very, very good at generating what it needs to do. So those honestly are four things that if you haven't tried them, please do, because they will make your lives a lot, lot easier uh, going forward. And if you don't, in my opinion, um, other people will, and then we'll end up getting left behind. So do take advantage of this stuff. Now, should we all be worried? Um, I don't know. Well, should I be worried? Let's see. So the next 10, 15, 20 slides, I got ChatGPT to generate for me. So the first question I asked ChatGPT was, can you generate me some presentation slides about the advantages of AI? So I'm just going to go through these, and we can see how good they are. So increased efficiency. AI technology can automate repetitive tasks and mundane tasks um, like documentation creation, um, figuring out how to create some reg regex, etc. Um, with AI, processes can be streamlined and optimized, leading to efficiency and productivity, like I mentioned. Um, AI power systems can work 24 7 without fatigue because, unfortunately, as, as developers, we do need to go to sleep and eat now and again. 
um, enhanced decision making. So AI algorithms can analyze vast amounts of data quicker than we can as humans. Um, machine learning algorithms can identify patterns and trends that humans might miss. And AI can help businesses make data driven decisions, um, resulting in improved outcomes and reduced risks. Again, still generated slides here. Um, improved customer experience, you can create chatbots, etc., which we're seeing quite a lot of these days. Um, I think you can even ask ChatGPT to build you a chatbot um, and provide the code for you. So um, it's quite easy to get started with this stuff. Uh, Recommendation-based systems on AI algorithms can offer tailored product recommendations, which I think is what we want as a society more and more. No one wants to look the same as everyone else. I think everyone wants to show their individualness. So having these kind of uh, individual experience for customers, I think, is great. Um, and natural language processing uh, enables AI to understand, understand and respond to customer queries. Now, me personally, I hate talking to robots when I'm on a call center. I'd much rather talk to a human but I think um, yeah what what's we might is we're trying to automate as much as possible right so I think generally it's good as long as the actual AI behind it is decent uh, cost savings so AI can help businesses reduce costs by automating processes eliminating the need for manual labor predictive maintenance powered by AI AI can equip with failures so it can tell you, you can use AI to predict when, for example, you might get a massive load of requests coming to your, um, your microservices and it can scale up ahead of time. So a new, for example, I could be a company that sells mobile phones and the new iPhone has come out. And as soon as Apple announces that they're gonna release the new iPhone, my AI can learn from that and it can say, look, you're gonna get a lot of requests for reservate, reserving the iPhone and buying the iPhone on these dates and these dates. So I am going to up the capacity in your infrastructure. So AI can be used for things like that, which is awesome. Um, can also be used for inventory management to optimize stock levels, blah, 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 blah. So it knows, say, I've got 100 stores. I know this store keeps running out of this. but So it can basically figure out roughly how much stock I need to put in there. So again, lots of different ways we can use it. Um, innovation and creativity. Um, as we've seen with the image generation, it is really great. I am a terrible artist. I cannot draw to save my life. Um, but I do write articles from now and again that I'd like some custom pictures in. So I have been using AI to generate those pictures. So it's great like that. Um, I think, yeah, I think it's great for, I've used it for <laughs> creating random marketing spiel just to see how good it is compared to our marketing team. So I think it is quite good for creativity. Uh, improved safety, so AI can be employed in various industries to enhance safety and reduce risk. Um, autonomous pit vehicles powered by AI. So this is a bit, yeah, I get a bit worried in some regards because when we talk about autonomous vehicles, you've got to remember we have to train them sometimes to do s to think about some horrible situations. Um, and I'll get into that in the disadvantages, but just keep that in your mind. Um, and the AI-based surveillance can detect anomalies and potential threats. So when it was King Charles' coronation, I think it was about a month ago now, um, this was the first time the Metropolitan Police in the United Kingdom deployed AI to every security camera in London. I think the UK is regarded as one of the most watched countries in the world. If you go and look around, you will see a security camera everywhere pointing at you. Um, that's just how we live. But this is the first time they used AI in London en masse to identify any threats, um, to pick out people in the crowd that they might think might be a threat. Um, yes, I don't know. A lot of people weren't too happy about this. This was a law they rushed into and uh, basically deployed this very, very quickly just before the coronation. But again, um, as long as it's used by the right people in the right way, um, it can be used for good and to stop any disastrous things happening. We already talked about uh, personalized experience. So again, it can personalize the right experience for you as a customer, et cetera, things like that. So this is the conclusion that ChatGPT came up with in regards to the advantages. So artificial intelligence offers numerous advantages across various industries, well duh, um, from increased efficiency, um, enhanced decision-making, or to improve customer experience and cost saving, AI is transforming the way we work and live. And embracing AA technologies can unlock new opportunities and drive innovation in the digital age. So that's not bad. I think I think ChatGPT did quite a good, um, quite good at trying to generate slides. So now let's look at the disadvantages. And remember, that there is a bias in here. So see if you can spot it. I have asked it the same question, just instead of advantages, I put disadvantages. So see if you can spot the bias. 
So first of all, job displacement. AI and automation technologies have the potential to replace human workers in various industries. Yeah? Uh, the automation of tasks previously performed by humans could lead to job losses and unemployment. Yeah, I'd say so. But then again, we're in the industry of automating everyone else out of a job anyway, so we can't really be hypocrites there. Um, AI systems lack the ability to exhibit human level judgment. Um, intuition and creativity. So this is where it gets a bit complicated because for example, I'm driving a vehicle, well, I'm not driving, the vehicle is driving itself, it's an autonomous, autonomous car, and a child steps out into the road. Now the vehicle has to make a decision. Now as a human, we probably won't have the time to say, okay, so first of all, yeah, the vehicle, a child runs into the road, the vehicle has the ability to get around that child. But if it goes left, it could kill, say, an old person that's on the pavement. If it swerves right, it could hit a family car that's traveling the opposite way down the road. But we have to, AI has to know that. It has to program that. It has to kind of understand. Whereas as humans, we wouldn't think twice about that. Yes, we probably swerve, but we wouldn't think, okay, I'm not gonna hit that person. I'm gonna hit that person. We just try and get out the way of the child. Whereas AI is so fast, it does actually have to make these decisions of which person it's gonna hit. Um, so that is one of the, the problems with AI. And technically, you know, Terminator films, um, Skynet was kind of right. I mean, you re remove humans from the equation of the planet Earth and we no more global warming. Well, they can reduce it anyway. Um, the planet will be better, there'll be less plastic produced. Um, so again, uh, AI it is trying to do the right thing, but it just lacks the personality and it just lacks the uh, intuition um, as, as humans do. Privacy concerns, again, AI systems often require vast amounts of data to operate effectively. Pretty sure ChatGPT4 was fed the whole of the internet. And collecting and analyzing personal data, as we saw with GitHub Copilot, for example, um, raises some security concerns, because again, I think GitHub Copilot was um, looking at um, private repositories, which is a no-no. Uh, dependence on technology. Um, I, I think we have this problem anyway. I don't think this is just an AI-specific thing, but dependence on technology. What if um, we start relying on AI for all these different things and one day it just stopped working? Um, but again, I think our generation has, uh, my generation has the same problem. I think if the internet went down, then the world would end for a lot of people. Uh, so I don't think that's an uh, AI-specific problem. Um, ethical concerns, like I kind of said, there's biases that um, AI will possibly present, but again, humans have the same thing. Um, lack of emotional intelligence, so they can't emphasize with people. They're very strict and very to the point of what they want to do. Um, so they're not very good at that. And this limitation makes it challenging for AI to handle sensitive or complex situations that require emotional intelligence, because AI just doesn't have any. Um, unemployment and income equality. So of course AI is going to take jobs. Um, that's the point of automation. And it can displace workers and they may struggle to find other opportunities. Blah, blah, blah. Lack of accountability. So yeah, like I go back to the car analogy. Um, who, who's kind of responsible when AI goes wrong? Who's responsible when some, uh, you know, AI does something really bad? So that, yeah, uh, with a human, you know, they're accountable, but with AI, you don't. So this is the conclusion, again, of the AI slides, the last generated slides I've got. Um, where, while AI offers numerous benefits, it is important to be aware of its potential disadvantages. Addressing these challenges require careful consideration, regulation, and ethical frameworks. Yeah, I agree with that. Now, can anyone see the difference between the first lot of generated slides on the advantages of AI and the second slides? Hands up anyone who saw the difference between those slides? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, precisely. So that's one thing. So AI, yep, it's not supposed to be biased in this regard, but it seems that when you ask it about itself, it's a bit, it's a bit more, it promotes itself a little bit more. Can anyone else see what the different advantages are, uh, the differences? I'll go back, look at all these slides, and look at these slides. Can you see that there's three points on the advantages? I asked it exactly the same question, but there's three points on the advantages, but oh, disadvantage, oh no, there's only two now. <laughs> so already we can see bias in what AI is doing, especially if you're talking about itself. So yeah.
So maybe I should be a little bit worried. I don't know. I, I think it did a good job at generating those slides. Um, I didn't want to do a good job at presenting them because I don't want AI to take my job. But, you know, I think it did a good, a good job at trying to find the information. Again, I like to consider ChatGPT as like Google on steroids. I can find this information, but it'll probably take me half an hour rather than five minutes, if you know what I mean. So, so should we all be worried? Should we all be worried about AI? Um, yes and no. Um, do I think AI is going to take over the world? Well, it was quite no until uh, my director actually showed me um, a robot with a gun on it powered by AI firing at targets. And I was like, all right, maybe we should be a little bit worried then. <laughs> That's a bit scary. Um, but should we be worried in regards to losing our jobs? No, um, I do not think so. Personally, we are going to be the last people in jobs on the planet. Our job is to automate everything. Essentially, our job as engineers and developers is to automate everyone else out of a job. That is essentially what we're going to do. Hopefully, we'll all be in a utopia where no one has to work, machines do all the work for us, and we can just live our lives, you know, work a few hours a week. But unfortunately, that's not going to happen in our lifetime. Um, and unfortunately, like I mentioned, we're going to be the last people on Earth with jobs. So be prepared to be working till you die. But robots can now pretty much do everything. I've seen Boston Dynamics robot paint walls, climb up scaffolding, throw up toolboxes. Like, if you've got enough money, you can build some a robot. You can use AI to do anything nowadays. And we can. Pr and so that was always the thing. It was like, oh, who's going to do a painting job? Who's going to do a building job? We can do it now. We can build it with robots and AI. So, is AI going to take lots of jobs? Yes. Um, but we can't be hypocrites because that's our job essentially is to automate everyone else out of a job, which is great. I mean, that's the point. We're trying to improve the planet so humans can just enjoy their lives rather than working five days a week. And we will see this in our lifetime, probably people's work reduced to four and three days a week, but not quite yet. We've got more work to do, guys. So yeah, keep going, keep going. Um, so when I think about AI and robots, I like to think about this little guy. Um, I'm not scared of him, you know, he doesn't do much. But then when we start to get scared, we start to think about these things. Now, this is quite a good quote. Um, and I think this is one of the reasons AI will not be taking our jobs. Because um, to replace programmers with AI, product managers need to accurately describe what they want. So don't worry, I think we're safe for now. Um, one of the guys, I, I've actually delivered this talk in uh, Portugal a couple of weeks ago, and one of the guy, other speakers, he loves AI. He's even used AI to automate his scrums. He's used AI for loads of different things. And I showed him this, and he goes, oh, that's a good idea. I could create an AI bot that could convert um, convert product manager speak to developer speak. I was like, don't you dare. <laughs> don't you dare. I was like, I will do my job for a bit longer, thank you. Um, but no, I don't think as, as engineers, uh, we need to worry. Um, AI is going to help us do our jobs a lot more efficiently. And I think, um, I think we're all safe in regards in our lifetime of not losing our jobs. Because again, I think we are going to be the last people on this planet that are still working, which is not a bad thing. But yeah, it'd, like to, it'd be nice to have a rest first, right? Um, but unfortunately, uh, so some of these slides are from my other presentation, if you did come to it earlier, but the bad guys have evolved. Now, they are now using AI to attack us and take advantage of our loving, free, caring, sharing nature. Um, cyber attacks are massively on the rise these days, and the people doing the cyber attacks, they are not also do always doing it for personal gain, but... Um, to essentially inflict as much harm on other people and other nation states as possible. So that could be taking down critical infrastructure. Um, it could be disrupting your food supply chain. All these things then affect your economy, um, negatively affecting your country as a whole. And they're not just going straight in and doing it. They may wait for the right ideal opportunity. You may be having a national holiday, and that's when they'll start using their vulnerabilities that they've got into your system with to then cause as much havoc as possible. So again, I talked a bit about this earlier, but Maven Central um, has lots of different layers of protection. Um, the first ones we have, for example, is... Uh, so these are different ways that people... That bad people are trying to get in so they might use for example a version 9999999 you as a person you'll download you might put latest in and you get this vulnerable version um, again typo squatting log j4 rather than log for j now the two top ones we don't have to worry about in maven central because when maven central was created uh, one of the first things they did is essentially um, make you have to own the domain 
but I can go and buy this domain with Apache that's spelled wrong, and that is allowed. Um, and we all make mistakes, we all make typo mistakes, but this is what they're doing. Now, everything that goes into uh, Maven Central is scanned with Sonotype's commercial scanners, so no malware goes in, but things like Python, um, they don't have the same kind of stuff um, as proof of domain, etc. So there is a lot of malware in Node and Python. And if you've used Node before, you know, you do an NPM install, well, you've just literally just gone and said, right, I'm going to install whatever these packages are. Whereas with Java, we don't do that. It's only a problem when we hit that line of code. So Java actually seems to be a lot more secure than the others. Um, I'm going to skip these two. Okay, so again, I talked about this earlier, but there's some extra things going into Maven Central. So when you go, for example, to log for JPEG in a certain version, you can see what critical and medium vulnerabilities they are. And also there's a visualization tool which Sonotype have created for free um, to allow you to visualize those different dependencies. Um, I talked about this earlier again, but we're quite late to change. So obviously the stewards of Maven Central, we have lots of data. We know how many people are downloading vulnerable log4j versions. And this was six months after that, um, ex well, that vulnerability was announced and 51 million people have downloaded it. Now, if I fast forward a year, now we <laughs> we're up to a lot, a lot of different people that have downloaded it. And it's still 25% of the downloads of log4j on that day were the vulnerable version. So unfortunately, we're the ones that are a little bit slow. Um, but there is loads of tools and loads of automation to do this, so there is no excuse. Um, I'm skipping forward a bit because I know I'm running out of time here. Um, open source is amazing, right? We're all using open source code all the time. 90% of the applications we use are now someone else's code. Whereas if you go back 25 years, we were the ones creating all the functionality in our applications, whereas now 90% of that we use from somewhere else which is fine. I mean, open source is amazing. We all should be trying to help each other. There's no point writing a code, some code or functionality that someone else has wrote already. We might as well share it. But if we look at Java applications, uh, say a average Java project on GitHub has 150 dependencies, 10 releases a year. That's 1,500 dependencies to manage. And you've probably all seen this one before, this picture. Um, but we don't know. Do you check who writes, who creates all your dependencies that you download, that 90% of your application? Because it could be this one guy in Nebraska that's been maintaining it since 2003. What happens if he stops? Or what happens if a bad actor takes over that, that open source dependency from him? Are you going to be aware? Probably not. So these are the kind of things we need to be aware of because people are using AI more and more and more to get into our systems. Um, this is a screenshot of Bomb Doctor, but Bomb Doctor allows you to say this is Spring Boot, allows you to import all your dependencies um, and what dependencies they imported and what they imported, and then we can see the score and if they've got any vulnerabilities in. So for example, this one probably has a very, very bad vulnerability in. Now don't worry, this isn't the latest version of Spring. This is just what I use for an example, um, but it's just to kind of demonstrate that we're pulling in a lot of stuff nowadays, so we need to be careful. So the modern face of cybercrime, um, it's changed quite a lot. I think perception of people around the world is, you know, it's difficult tasks, detailed plots, um, high tech and elaborate schemes. Reality, that is not what it is. Um, but reality is very simplicity uh, affected. And basically, it's just people trying their luck as many times because I guarantee you, if they try their luck a thousand times, they'll find one person that they can attack. Um, and that's essentially what they're doing. I'm not going to go into too much detail about this because this is quite Python heavy. But potentially we call them, well, we call, they're called script key kiddies. Are they young? Not always. Are they inexperienced? Sometimes, sometimes not. Are they hackers? Probably not. Just a load of people trying their luck. Um, most of the malicious packages are not the product of a quirky genius in a hoodie coding in the dark filled with a basement filled with monitors, unfortunately. It's just people trying their luck over and over again until they manage to hit the jackpot, get into some poor sucker system who didn't update a dependency correctly, and then they can hold your company for ransom and possibly bankrupt it. But I'm going to go past here because, again, this is very Python-focused. But there was... Is it here? Basically, this is... Um, a vulnerability script that we've now got taken down off GitHub, as it should be. Um, but then we asked uh, AI ChatGPT to generate something similar. And as you can see, it's pretty much generated the same thing after this was already removed from GitHub. So that people are using AI to generate 
as well as many different malwares and vulnerabilities as possible, but they're using a AI to create bots that are constantly trying to put these into the repositories we use. Now, again, Java developers, we're all safe because, well, mostly safe because Maven Central, again, you have to have proof of domain, but Node didn't ever make that decision. Python, their registries didn't make that decision at the beginning, and now they are suffering for it. People are using bots, they're using AI to generate this malware and then using bots to push it up to as many places as they can in the hope that just one person downloads it. It's one person, say, download it from Microsoft or IBM, they get into their companies um, and then they can cause a lot, a lot of damage. So, yeah. And um, I don't think I've got it on these slides, but there is actually a malware of a service you can use where they will support your malware, they will generate malware for you. So. Yeah, it's getting quite scary what they can do with AI these days. Um, I went over this briefly in my last presentation, um, but essentially this is talking about the, cyber, the facts of cybercrime. So in 2016, it was worth 450 billion US dollars a year. That is equivalent to 50 of these nuclear powered, the biggest nuclear aircraft carriers in the world. I imagine, I think you can all imagine that in 2022, that's gone up which it has, um, $6 trillion a year, $200,000 a second, equivalent to 620 of the world's biggest nuclear aircraft carriers, of which I think the US currently has eight. So as you can imagine, they make a lot of money. If it was a country, it would have the third highest GDP in the whole world. And Pablo Escobar today would not be using, uh, be in the drug trade. He would be using a laptop to make money because um, people that are hackers, people in cybercrime, very, very rarely get caught, whereas we all kind of know what happened to this guy. So that's the problem. AI is only going to make security harder. Um, AI is great when it's in the hands of good people, but it's not so great when it's in the hands of bad people. Uh, the zero day window is closing. So in 2006, you had about 45 days to fix a vulnerability when it came out. And now um, we've noticed with Log4J, once that vulnerability was announced, um, you had less than a day and the, the hackers and the bad actors were trying to get into our stuff. And it's worrying because you wouldn't, you wouldn't ship a vehicle if you knew it was faulty. You wouldn't, as a manufacturer, you wouldn't ship something if you knew it was faulty, but why would you ship software that you know has vulnerabilities in that people can attack? So this is changing, the EU, the US, the UK, Germany actually has its own laws coming out specifically for this, Australia, New Zealand, um, basically making us as developers responsible for the code we ship nowadays, and as it should be, because yeah, manufacturers don't get away with doing that, they would go to court and possibly prison, so why, why should developers get away with shipping vulnerable stuff? Um, but there's lots of information on that, do keep up to date with it, because some of this stuff is going to be coming into force, which will make us responsible for this stuff. But my point here is o open source code is in everything. It's in insulin pumps, it's in aircraft, it's in self-driving cars, it's in trains, um, so which is increasing the attack vector that people can attack us in lots of different ways. So do keep security at the front of your mind um, when you're building applications. And there is lots of open source stuff around, there's lots of tooling around. Uh, Sonotype have lifecycle and firewall and things like that that can help with this. But you want to automate it. You don't want to have to be manually um, managing these vulnerabilities by checking databases, etc. So how do we use AI? Um, we use AI in lots of different ways. So this is basically where um, Sonotype, some of Sonotype's products fit. Um, but essentially we're using AI to fight AI. So Cernotype Firewall, which is one of my favorite products, essentially sits between, say, your public repo, which could be Maven Central, and your local repository or your company's directory, um, which would be uh, Nexus repository, Artifactory, something like that. And what it does is it scans every dependency you pull down. It scans that with uh, machine learning and AI 24-7, all day. We're constantly training it. Um, it observes every line of code and every commit in these dependencies. Um, and then what it'll do is it can quarantine suspicious um, dependencies. So I think we did a re some research and it came out yesterday that we've saved companies about $1.5 billion in, um, <laughs> in savings from uh, vulnerabilities that could have take, been taken advantage of. Um, I think today, uh, Firewall has saved companies again. Uh, this is probably a bit out of date, but it's 115,165. That's how many packages we have identified at Sonatype that no one else has that have either malware in or vulnerabilities in. So it's quite a lot. Um, and we're using AI constantly to do this. So for example, this is kind of how it works. Very simple. You pull down from any of these kind of repositories. It goes into Firewall. 
if we know that package is good, boom, it's straight into your local repository. If we're not sure, we'll go here. The AI will do some learning. The security team will then do some research. And these people, there's about 100 of them, they do this all day, every day. They're amazing. They just go through line and line of code. They usually go off to Discord servers. That'll pull down a script. That script will go somewhere else. That'll pull down another script. So they're very good at hiding things. Um, but our team is very good at doing that. And then if it's all good, they find nothing. Yep, you can download it. If it's bad, it goes into quarantine. And the only way you can get it out there, out of there is if you basically specifically say, I don't care, um, but I would not advise that. But we're using constantly AI all the time to learn um, from these packages. But of course, I get asked, why, why don't you just use AI? Why do you need a security research team? Well, AI needs training. Um, and a lot of these vulnerabilities and exploits, they are new. They are brand new and someone's just created it. So the AI is great at finding things that patterns that may have existed before, but when they completely change the pattern and try and throw us all off, that's when you need a security research team that knows this stuff to kind of find that and then go back to the AI and train it. Um, but then you can get loads of insights, for example, um, it, gives, it gives you an integrity score. It can also find out breaking changes, all kinds of cool stuff like that. So this is kind of coming to an end now. Um, I won't give you a Bomb Doctor summary, but Bomb Doctor is a really great way of visualizing your dependencies. There is some AI behind this as well to figure out different scores. It uses machine learning to give you a vulnerability score, a popularity score, and a license score, um, because some people like to change licenses without us knowing, and we don't want to um, be doing anything illegal. So kind of to summarize um, everything I've talked about today, and again, this is my opinion, so uh, if you disagree with it, that's absolutely fine. But AI is, in my opinion, not gonna take most of our jobs anytime soon, so we should all be fine. It'll take some other people's jobs, yes, but that is what we've been doing in software for the last um, 100 years or 50 years or whatever. Current AI technology has been around a while. Again, this is not new technology. It's just now very user-friendly, and I think the general, the general person on the street can now use this stuff. My auntie, who barely knows how to boot up a computer, has been playing around with ChatGPT. So this is why it's popular, not because there's been some massive crazy advancement in the last year in AI. Again, my opinion. Um, it can, de it can definitely make us more productive. And I honestly think that I've been speaking to a lot of developers. I'd say 50% have embraced it, 50% have not. Honestly, I think the 50% that have embraced it within two, three years, they're gonna be so far ahead of the 50% that haven't embraced it, that those 50% that didn't might end up having to f either <laughs> embrace it in some way or find a different job because honestly AI is making us so efficient and it can help in so many different ways I don't know why you wouldn't use it um, it can be used for evil as I've demonstrated you can use it to generate malware you can create bots that try and spam every registry and repository on the planet um, but don't worry because this is where we can use uh, good AI or AI in the hands of good people to fight the bad AI um, so I think we should all be okay uh, there is some useful links here. Uh, if anyone wants to find out about any of the information I talked to today, um, this is where I got most of the research from. So do feel free to check it all out. Um, get in touch if you have any questions about anything about Sonotype products or anything like that. There is some cool stuff here to check out. Um, obviously, I talked about, well, I didn't talk about it, but we've got a new Maven Central because it's been the same way for 10 years and it looks a bit like it was created in the 90s, which it was, well, near enough. So um, yeah, we we're changing the website, so do feel free to give us feedback there. Um, and if you want to know more about software composition analysis and stuff there, me and my director have wrote a nice series on Vuje. Um Again, try out Bomb Doctor. It's a really good tool, completely free to use, experimental. Um, and with that, I would like to say thank you for all most of you staying awake after eating lunch. And um, the only reason I'm awake is because I've got to stand up. So here I am. Hello, Mohammed. Um, other than that, yeah, thank you all for attending my talk. I hope you have enjoyed JCon and have a great rest of the afternoon. Thank you, everybody.